week. So please welcome. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And uh, I'll be talking on reconnection in biology and physics. And um, I can get my slide. There we go. So I started life as a pure mathematician doing knot theory, in fact, higher dimensional knot theory. And um, this was a picture that got me interested in applications of topology. So this is a knotted DNA circle. And this knotted DNA, this is an electron micrograph of a real DNA uh, molecule. And um, it tells a story of proteins that made it. These proteins are called top isomerases, and they can take DNA and pass DNA through itself by means of an enzyme-bridged transient break. So this knot is a signature of the protein that made it. And so when I saw this picture, I said, you know, this looks like full employment for topologists. Uh, so you might ask, why is topology so useful in science? Um, Topology is really discretized geometry, and any change in topology is a big change because it's discrete, and so it often can be experimentally observed. Uh, so that's why it's a good thing to look for in a scientific experiment. Uh, topology has been very popular recent in the Nobel Prizes. This 2016 Chemistry Nobel Prize was survived in coworkers where they made knotted and linked molecules. The idea is to make perhaps a link like this hop link here, or a link with lots of little circles in it, and you can make the little circles sort of move. And so that's the beginnings of a nano machine. Uh, the two, 2016 Nobel Prize in Physics was also based in topology. So this is the work of Kostelitz, where you have a topological phase transition. So you've got this, uh, medium here that's at very low temperature and you've got vortex formation and the vortices appear in counter rotating pairs like this and as you raise the temperature you have a topological phase transition where the tightly bound pairs of vortices are now free to move around and so this is a big change and you can do experiments and uh, they, they did that very interesting work uh, the physicists get the message is that topology is, in fact, very useful. I went to the 2017 American Physical Society National Meeting in New Orleans, and uh, half the talks had the word topological in the title. I did not go to all these talks. I just re recording here what the, some of the titles were. Topological resistors, topological insulators, topological singularities, topological charge spin density waves, topological skirmions, topological superconductivity, and on and on. Carl Human. Uh, and here's a beautiful experiment. About Levine's lab at the University of Chicago, where they, for the first experiment, and hopefully show a video of it later on in the talk. Um, And also in the work of Kleckner, and, uh, and I think Lewis worked on this as well, uh, they looked at how superfluid vortex knots untie. And here you've got, in a superfluid, you can have the gross pitayevsky equation that gives you a phase map on the exterior of these topological forms. And so you have a phase map. And here's a picture of the phase here. So I'll be talking about phase maps later on and ciphered surfaces for these knots and links in the gross pitayevsky equation. Um, you can get knots and pneumatic colloids. So I'm just giving a list here of the, some of the very interesting papers that have appeared in the last, say, 10 or 15 years. And here you can use the laser to kind of make your favorite knot or link in these, in these pneumatic colloids. Uh, you can have knotted defects in pneumatic liquid crystals. Again, these are diagrams taken directly from uh, Gareth Alexander's paper. You can have knots in light waves. So this is the work of Mark Dennis. Very interesting work there as well. Uh, you can have entanglement in quantum computing. So here's a picture of the sort of a trefoil knot that came from an article on quantum computing in a physics journal. You can have knotted and linked magnetic fields. 
So this is a diagram from a meeting in Beijing that uh, occurred last year. This is the hop vibration, where your, the magnetic field lines form the hop vibration. You can have topological data analysis. So uh, the idea is to compute persistence homology with a cloud of points. You've got points that come from an experiment in some high dimensional Euclidean space, and you can triangulate this data point cloud and compute homology, and your scale tells you when to connect points up, and you can see what happens as the scale changes. So when you get some homology groups that persist as you change the scale, then hopefully that's a message about the physics of the experiment. Uh, following Darcy Thompson, there's a nice analogy between, say, fluid dynamics and biology and chemistry. Helicity, which I'll talk about, and it involves the link, twist, and writhe in magnetic fields, is related to DNA supercoiling, how DNA winds up on itself. And vortex reconnection is involved with DNA recombination. And this gross Pitaevsky isosurface that you get in these uh, low temperature situations where you have defects and are related to the belosov zabotinsky equation, waves of excitation in an excitable medium. So I'll be talking about these, these, each of these things. So here's an example of vortex reconnection. So this is a pair of contrails from a two engine jet plane, and you can see these things. So they're swirling vortices, uh, vortex tubes, and they reconnect, giving you these sort of circles here. Um, Solar flares that are coming out of the sun. These are magnetic field lines. They can reconnect with themselves. And when they reconnect, you get a circle of uh, energy that spins off into space. And when it, and if it, it hits the earth, then it messes up uh, communications on earth. But here's a picture of an anti-parallel flux tube reconnection. So I've got these flux tubes say, in magnetic fields and they're oriented by say the right hand rule. On the top one, you have like a right hand screw in the blue one on top that's going from right to left. And on the bottom, it's going from left to right. So this is anti-parallel orientation of these flux tubes. You have a reconnection event where the, the lines reconnect and then you get this situation here. Uh, so I'll be looking at anti-parallel reconnections. Uh, here's a picture that I stole from Renzo Rica. And again, that's a picture of these flux tubes where you have say two magnetic field lines on the top so it's oriented from right to left, I'm sorry. Ah, I don't know how to, I can't make this thing go back. It only goes forward. Okay, so here we are where we have on the top, you have tubes that go from right to left and left to right. Reconnects the blue one on the top and the yellow one on the bottom. And this is exactly what happens in DNA. So here's a picture of duplex DNA where you have. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm getting some, is somebody asking a question? I don't know. Well, on the top, you have duplex DNA, and uh, you have a red and blue curve. And on the bottom, you have a red and blue. So it's just like the picture in the magnetic field lines. And here you have the red curve on the top, reconnecting with the red curve on the bottom. So this is partial. This is called a holiday junction. So it's an intermediate between the total reconnection, which reconnects both the red and the blue on the top to the red and the blue on the bottom. So. Anti-parallel reconnection changes curve topology because it preserves the curve orientation. I'm looking at oriented curves in space. If you have a single circle that reconnects with itself, it becomes a pair of circles that can be linked. And that single circle could be knotted, for example. But if you have two circles that reconnect, they become one circle. So it goes from one to two to one to two. So it's a mod two situation. If you have iterated reconnections, and here's a statement about what entanglement is. So you can have entanglement in linear curves like writhing and linking. Uh, here you've got knotting in a linear curve and knotting in a circular curve and linking in a pair of circles. So 
one of the most primitive measures of topological entanglement is the crossing number. So if you have a curve in space and you reduce it so that it crosses itself in a plane projection a minimum number of times, that's the crossover number. So that's a topological invariant. So here we have the unknot with crossover number zero, the Hopflink crossover number two, where you just count the crossings, the trefoil with crossover number three. And Mother Nature doesn't like entanglement. DNA entanglement, if you have, say, circular DNA in a cell, for example, in a bacterium, if it's entangled, it can block replication of the cell, it can block transcription of proteins, it causes mutation and leads to cell death. So entanglement in a cell has to be very carefully controlled. And it's controlled by these enzymes that pass DNA through itself and uh, reconnect DNA to itself by site-specific recombination. And in vortices and fluid dynamics, the vortex entanglement can block energy dissipation. So vortex reconnection is my mother nature uses it to sort of disconnect these vortices and get them all unknotted and unlinked from each other. And mother nature finds a way somehow to eliminate all the entanglement, which is an inter very interesting problem as to exactly how this happens because um, it solves the entanglement by topoisomerase strand passage. That's one way DNA does it. It uses DNA recombination sometimes to do unlinking. It's, I'll show you an experiment in a minute. So vortex reconnection can simplify vortex topology. But the major problem here is that entanglement is a global phenomenon. And all these methods by solving it, they're local things. And entanglement can be reduced below thermodynamic equilibrium to zero entanglement. This is what happens in biology and also in fluid dynamics. So how can these local actions solve these global problems? This is still a problem that isn't uh, completely understood. It's hard. Uh, well, I was gonna show you uh, the experiment. Uh, here we go. So this is um, Irvine's experiment done in a fluid, and he manufactured hydrofoils. And here you have an unknotted hydrofoil. You put uh, bubbles on it, and then you pull it down in, a, in, a, in water, and it spits out a vortex tube, and the center of the vortex tube where the pressure is the lowest is where, the, where these bubbles go. So you have a vortex tube and the center is visible because it has these bubbles and you can see it with sheet lasers. But you can also do it with knots and with links. So here's a trefoil knot, a right-hand trefoil knot. And when you do this experiment, it spits out a trefoil knotted vortex. And what's interesting about these knotted vortices is to look at their reconnection uh, events. The unknot doesn't do much. It sort of just travels slowly through the liquid. These knotted ones, because they have a lot of high curvature, they move around a lot and then they reconnect with themselves. So here's a movie produced in the lab of the Hopflink. So here's the Hopflink. They froze it here. You can see that it is two unlinked circles. It is the Hopflink and you're gonna see a reconnection event here in a minute. So the reconnection event is right there, right there. So when it reconnects, now you have a single unknotted, very large circle. So the hop flink reconnected to become a single unknotted large circle. This large circle is now gonna reconnect with itself, I think right here. And when that happens, you get an unlink of two unknotted components. So this is kind of the end of the vortex thing. You had the hop flink becoming a single unknotted circle, which reconnected to become two unknotted and unlinked circles. Here's the right hand trefoil knot, and it's going to reconnect with itself to become the hop flink, as you'll see in just a minute. So they freeze it and rotate it around, and here you see the anti parallel reconnection. So it reconnects kind of right there. Boom, it's reconnected now. Now they go out to, to zoom out, and it what you have now is the hop flink. It's a little hard to see, but that is what, it, what you get. So if you were to start with a trefoil knot, it would reconnect with itself to become the hop flink. The hop flink would reconnect with itself to become a large unknotted circle. This unknotted circle would reconnect with itself to become two smaller unknotted and unlinked circles. 
So here's a close-up of this trefoil anti-parallel reconnection, where you can sort of count if you're trying to, trying to compute some blinking or writhing. And I'm going to do a proof in a minute that anti-parallel reconnection on these vortices preserves the writhe. So it, that's one of the invariants. It's not a topological invariant, it's a geometric invariant, but it's preserved by anti-parallel reconnection. Uh, what's interesting about the uh, fluid dynamics is that if you look at molecular biology, here's a, an interesting paper by uh, Mario Vasquez and uh, David Sherratt. And they prove that you have a unique minimal pathway in this XER FTSK. So this is a site, it's a recombination system in E. coli. And you have, the idea is that these linked DNA molecules are produced by replication. And it's sort of replication that sort of fails to disentangle the replicons. So you, here you have the blue one and the yellow one. They are replicons and what you want to do is to separate them so that they, they can go to individual cells. So when a cell, when a cell reproduces, every bit of DNA in the cell is faithfully reproduced and you then you have to segregate the daughter DNA molecules into the daughter cells. But sometimes Reconnect, the replication sort of fails right at the end and you get some of these torus links formed. They're all right-handed because DNA is right-handed. So this is the torus link 2 comma 6 and the idea is then to use, if you can't use top isomerase, you can do it another way. The cell always has many ways to do the same job. So here they're doing it with, the cell is doing it with recombination, site-specific recombination, where you have these two circles, the 2 6 torus link becomes the five one torus knot, which then reconnects with itself to become the four, the, the four link here, that's a torus link, the linking number two, which reconnects with itself to become the trefoil. And now from the trefoil, we're familiar with what happens. It becomes the hop link, which becomes the unknot, which reconnects to become these two unknotted and unlinked circles. And it's right here that the cell has then succeeded in separating these two replicons so that the yellow one can go to one cell and the blue one can go to another. And uh, there's a proof in this paper that this is the minimum pathway. There is no other, assuming that the, that, that the complexity decreases each time, that this is the minimum pathway that gets you from this 2-6 torus link down to this unlink of two components. So the various reconnection questions the detailed dynamics and helicity. I'll talk about helicity in a minute. It's a measure from fluid dynamics. This reconnection can serve helicity. We like to understand this reconnection cascade to the trivial link. Uh, it's the stepwise unlinking of DNA replication catenanes. So I'm now gonna do a proof that the writhe helicity is conserved by anti-parallel reconnection. So if you've got a pair of oriented skew lines in space, you can assign, you look at a, the projection and you can assign the sign to it. This is sort of a right-hand rule. If you change the orientation of one of the two curves or if you pass one curve through another, the sign changes. So to compute the writhe of a simple closed curve in space, think of the curve as being rigid. You take a projection of it and that gives you an integer. Almost all projections, unless you have a projection where you have like three things crossing together, but that's a, a set of measures zero and projections. So almost all projections have a, an integer you can assign to it. So this gives you an integer valued function on the space of projections. The space of projections is the unit two sphere in three space. So here I've got two projections of the very same thing where you see a writhe of plus two here and a writhe of plus three here. So to get something that is meaningful, you average this number over all sign, you average the sum of sign crossings over all projections. And this gives you this, the writhe of a curve in space. So here's some pictures of DNA that shows increasing writhe. So this is an unknotted, they're all unknotted, but you get plectinemic interwinding here and the more interwinding you get, the higher the writhe and pretty soon it looks like a stick. So, I'll be talking about piecewise linear curves and each pair of oriented edges in the curve can contribute to the writhe. And the contribution to the writhe consists of, you look at these two straight, these two arcs that are straight little straight lines in space. 
And for, you look at sometimes you'll be able to see a crossing. Most of the time you won't. But if you see a crossing, you remember that. And that gives you the set of all projections where you see a crossing gives you a pair of open sets on this unit two sphere. You got sort of one on the bottom and one on the top. And uh, so it gives you a signed area on the unit two sphere corresponding to a pair of curves. So if you're gonna compute the writhe, if you've got an oriented polygon, say within edges, you simply average these things up. So you compute all these pairwise contributions to writhe, and then you divide by the area of the sphere, and then that gives you the, the average value of this thing. So it's a real number that corresponds to sort of how much a curve is wound up in space. It's a geometric measure of entanglement, not a topological one. You can clearly change the ride and you sort of untwist the curve. Um, but this number is in fact, you can compute linking number the same way. Because if you take a pair of curves, let's say one within edges, A and B within edges, and you simply add up the ride contribution, so the curve, the, the edges in A against the edges in B, add all these little ride contributions up and divide by four pi, you get an integer in this case, which is the linking number, a topological invariant. And it's symmetric, the linking number of A and B is the same as the linking number of B with A. But what's interesting here is to look at the writhe of say, um, a pair of curves. So I've got A which has in edges and B with M edges and the writhe of the disjoint union of A union B is the edges of A against the edges of A, well that's the writhe of A. The edges of A against the edges in B, that's the linking number of AB. The edges in B against the edges in A, that's the linking number of B with A and then the writhe of B. So you get a, a formula that the writhe of A union B is the writhe of A plus two times the linking number of A and B plus the writhe of B. That's for the disjoint union of two curves. I'm now gonna think about doing a reconnection event where I've got two curves here. I've got a red one A and a black one B. They're oriented, they're both knotted, but that doesn't really matter. And I'm thinking of a thinking of them both now as fixed in space and separate them until I can reconnect them. So they start out being very close together. And I'm going to say translate B until it meets up with A. I'm going to reconnect them by taking this red edge here and making it join with the black edge here. I'm going to make them coincide. So when you move them, you get this intermediate here, which is a theta curve. I have it A connect some B star, so that's the theta curve intermediate between the disjoint union, and you can then pass from the theta curve intermediate to the connected sum by simply erasing this edge here that is so here. Now I'm gonna now argue that the writhe is invariant under these, these moves here by looking at the intermediate as being uh, sort of what's happening in between. So and I'm gonna remove the interior of this common edge to produce the reconnected guy. So the ride of A union B I claim is equal to the ride of the connected center intermediate. That's because the ride, here's the ride of A union B and all these quantities are preserved by a translation. So a translation serves all these numbers and in the connected sum thing, I'm gonna count the common edge twice, once going up and once going down. So everything adds up and I get that the writhe of A union B is in fact equal to the writhe of this connected, the theta curve intermediate. And now this theta curve intermediate, its writhe, I'm counting both the last edge in A and the last edge in B, A and in B and are counted, but they're going in opposite directions. They're oriented oppositely, so the rive contributions from one of them cancels out the rive contributions of the other. So you can then erase them and preserve the rive. So antiparallel reconnection conserves the rive. So the rive of A union B is equal to the rive of the connected sum, uh, A connects sum B. But again, I'm thinking of these as sort of rigid objects. I'm not moving them around. I'm 
And of course, what happens in the, in the fluids is that A and B are moving around all the time. So this is what happens just at the instant of reconnection. You had some motion before and motion afterwards, but at the instant of reconnection, the writhe is conserved. So if you have a single curve, it reconnects with itself to form two curves, and the writhe of the single curve changes approaching this limiting value, which is the writhe of the theta curve intermediate, where part of the curve is then reconnected to another part of the same curve. And the limiting value is the writhe of the reconnected pair of curves. So let's talk about um, reconnection and magnetic fields. So here I've got a magnetic vortex tube. I've got a center line C gamma. I've got one of the field lines R gamma, which is on the boundary of the tube. I've got a tube of these sort of vortex lines. And these two curves together form the boundaries of a ribbon. So I've got this ribbon R gamma that connects C gamma to this push off here. One of the standard things you can measure in, in, in DNA and with curves and ribbons is the twist of a ribbon. Um, if you parameterize everything by arc length, you've got the tangent vector here and the point on the curve, you've got a normal vector to this, one of the tubes on the boundary. This is the curve on the boundary, the red one. And the cross product of these two guys is the perp, perpendicular here. This gives you a three frame and this three frame can move along the curve. And if you look at the intrinsic amount that it rotates as you move along, you get this incremental twist. You then integrate it around the curve to get this line integral and it gives you the twist, which is again, a real number. It's not a topological invariant. It's a real number like the rive. But the interesting thing about this is that twist plus rive adds up to the linking number. So that's a famous theory of Caligariano. Um, so let's talk about helicity. Um, so if you've got a divergence-free solenoidal vector field, uh, B, and its vector potential is A, so B is equal to del cross A. B has, com well, I'm assuming it has compact support on a domain D, and it's confined to knotted in link tubes in D. So the helicity is this number that you get by taking A dot B and integrating over uh, V, over the domain D rather. And it turns out that this is a measure of twisting, knotting, and linking of field lines of B. And the absolute value of this number, he listed as a lower bound to the energy of B. So fortunately for us topologists, uh, Renzo and Keith Moffat were able to get a beautiful theorem that gives you the flux tube helicity in terms of the flux tube topology. So here's their theorem. We've got a flux tube with center line C gamma, a flux ribbon R gamma with flux phi, the flux ribbon boundary, which is the center line union, say a push off or one of the field lines, C gamma prime, it's on the boundary of the tube of the neighborhood. And the helicity is the flux squared times the self-linking number of this flux tube. And the self-linking number is the writhe plus the twist. And from previous work of Caligariano and uh, Jim White also worked on this. Rive plus the twist is in fact the linking number. So here you see the topological invariance of helicity. Uh, so we're gonna reconnect two tubes of the same flux and figure out what happens to the helicity. So for this calculation, I'm assuming that the flux is equal to one. Uh, so, What's the helicity of the union of two flux tubes? Well, we have two flux tubes, alpha and beta, of the same flux, phi equal to one. Uh, the helicity of the disjoint union of these two flux tubes is the self-linking number. Again, this is from the work of Rika and Moffat. The helicity of the disjoint union is the self-linking number of one plus the self-linking number of the other plus two times the linking number. And it's this factor of two times the linking number this is how I got from DNA into the uh, vortex game because I went to a talk given by uh, Shin Lu, one of uh, Renzo's collaborators, and he was talking about fluid dynamics and I saw this equation and I said, ah, two times the linking number, that comes from the writhe. So, hmm, very interesting. So, this number here, I'm, the self-linking number of alpha is the writhe plus twist, self-linking number of beta is writhe plus twist, 
two times the linking number. And now you sp spread this out and put it as the rive plus of one plus the rive of the other plus two times the linking number. That, of course, is the rive of A union B. And this is the twist of one ribbon plus the twist of the other ribbon. So we get the rive helicity. The helicity is equal to the rive helicity plus the twist helicity for a union of two flux tubes. And of course, we know that anti-parallel reconnection conserves the rive helicity. That's what I just proved. Uh, so if you forget the twist of the ribbon, the rive helicity is preserved. And in fact, uh, again, from um, um, the Irvine lab in water, twist helicity is dissipated by viscosity and the rive helicity persists. So the rive helicity is something important to, to focus on uh, in these reconnection events. And again, if you've got empty flux tubes, superfluid helium, and no field lines, no ribbon, and no twists, so you have helicity is simply a derived plus the torsion of the center line or the, the line itself. And both of these add unto the connect anti parallel reconnection. So helicity is conserved in this situation here for empty flux tubes. This ride and torsion add correctly for anti parallel. Uh, things. You can many times in a superfluid helium, for example, you can get a vortex tangle. It's, so it's a tangle of um, defects in the, uh, in the uh, phase uh, characterization of this, of this vortex situation. And we're looking at reconnection in this situation. So the tangle consists of, shall we say, in closed curves that are probably knotted in length and have high rise. If you've got a superfluid vortex tangle, say in curves, all linked up with each other, and you reconnect, say, the two of them, what happens to all these numbers? All these numbers are conserved by anti-parallel reconnection. Again, these are just center lines. They don't have tubes associated with them. So summations of linking numbers plus summations of rive. Um, you can also add in the torsion. All these things are conserved. So. I'm going to switch now and talk a little bit about um, excitable media. Um, and the reason I'm doing this is because in excitable media, you have waves of excitation, and these waves of excitation can terminate into knotted and linked uh, lines in, a, in, a, in, a, in an experiment. And this is the same thing that happens in the belosov zabotinsky in the belosov zabotinsky equation, and it happens in the uh, gross pitayevsky method for looking at, say, superflu superfluids. So there's a close relationship between wave phenomena and excitable media and links of defects and superfluids. So here's an excitable medium, say a grass fire in a, in a plain in, say, Nebraska, somewhere out west in the United States. You have dry grass, and if you set a fire, if you throw down, say, a cigarette, which you shouldn't do, but if you do that, you can get a grass fire, which is it goes out in a ring of fire. And just in front of this ring of fire, you have the grass is in an excitable state. It's brown, it's ready to be burned. And just behind the wave of excitation, it's in a refractory state. It's just been burned, it's black. So the, the grass fire can only go sort of in one direction. And it proceeds through the medium. And if you have two of these fires coming to meet each other like this, when they crash into each other, they annihilate because they can't, they can't propagate over where the other wave has just been because it's in a refractory state. So these waves annihilate themselves when they crash into each other. This is what happens in heart muscle with arrhythmia and fibrillation in the human heart and in the belosov zabotinsky reaction, which I'll be talking a little bit more about, and the wave at a football game. So here I'm thinking of a circular stadium full of fans. Uh, this was in the old days before the virus when you could actually have fans at a game, okay? So let's pretend we're in a game and it's a football game and not only is the stands full, there are people down on the field and they have the wave going, you know, and that's a wave of ex excitation because at, at this football game, an excitable medium are the fans themselves who are probably mostly drunk. And they start yelling and you get this wave of excitation going around the stadium. Now think about the person that's down in the middle of the field. When do they wave? Because they're standing there and this wave is going 
the people all around them are waving and the wave proceeds around them. But no matter when they wave, they have to be wrong. So the wave has to have a sync, the phase. right at that central point wave pattern there's no singularity here no defect so you have kind of a point that's acting as a beacon sending out waves these waves are isocons of concentration of chemicals in the bz reaction so there are isocons and but you can also have spiral waves here i've got a spiral wave that's rotating in a right hand like a right hand screw going out through the medium and here you've got this central point here so that's like a phaseless point, a place where the phase is discontinuous. And so it's a defect in the phase pattern. It's a point defect. Now, if you sort of go up to three dimensions, this target wave pattern becomes a pattern of spheres with kind of a central point that's acting like a, a beacon. But here you have these, this point becomes then a line, which is like on a, a scroll wave winding around it. So you get these scroll waves down these lines, if you do them in the, Free space, these lines can be knotted, so you can have knotted scroll waves. And these scroll waves, in fact, form a ciphered surface for these phase defects. So here's a picture of the belsov zabotinsky reaction where you can see the target patterns here, here. These are time solution, time evolution. So this is time zero, one, and two, if you like. And here you see these target patterns. The target pattern gets big. And then as you see, when the target pattern crashes into this pattern coming from these rotating vertices, they annihilate each other. And here you have a pair of counter-rotating vertices here. And basically what happens is these counter-rotating vertices more or less have to be born in, in counter-rotating pairs to preserve parity. So uh, you can, in fact, prove that if you work on it a little bit. Here's a picture with lots of arms coming into a single point. You can have, in this case, one, two, four, five, six waves coming into a single point in a two-dimensional version of the BC reaction. Uh, so it's possible to get very interesting things here, especially if you think about this happening in three space where this thing, this central point becomes a central line, and you've got all these waves coming in incident on this single curve here. So... Very interesting topology here. But I'm thinking of the wave pattern as giving me a phase map. Because here I've got this phaseless point or phaseless line, the red one. And here I've got this wave of excitation. And here I'm showing these arrows showing you the normal vector that, this is telling you the direction that this curve is going. And if you take out the phaseless points, you take the medium that it's in minus the phase singularity, so this link say, and you have a map from this to the phase circle. And the pullback of the base point here turns out to be this wave front here that terminates in this uh, link here. So I have a phase map given by the experiment itself. Or in the case of the Belisov, in the case of GPE, it's given to you by the GPE equation. So, I'm going to call this, if you like, the Gross-Pitayevsky isosurface that comes from the phase map. So I've got a vortex link in R3. I've got the complement of this vortex link. I've got R3 minus the link L. I've got a GPE phase map from X to S1. And the isosurface, which is a Seinfeld surface, is the pullback of the base point on the phase circle. And the boundary of the link is equal to L. So this thing V, the ciphered surface, has boundary this link, this link of, of defects, say, in the superfluids. So that's the ciphered framing. So I've got an oriented link, then a ciphered surface is an oriented surface whose boundary is equal to the link. And the GPE isosurface, optical knots, the BZ reaction wavefront, these are all examples of ciphered surfaces. So from here on out, I'll be looking at ciphered surfaces in these link situations. And if you've got a ciphered surface, then with one arm coming in, then the ribbon itself and the push off are part of the ciphered surface of V. 
So the push arc is like the other field line, if you like. So here I've got the cypress surface of the red trefoil knot K. And if you take the push off of K along the cypress surface, you get K prime. And they co-bound a little ribbon. So that's the ribbon that lives inside the tube. Uh, and if you trim off the ribbon, then you get the cypress surface V prime, whose boundary is equal to K prime. So V prime is V minus the ribbon on K. The boundary V is K, but the boundary V prime is K prime, and K does not intersect the V prime. So linking and intersection numbers, are, you can compute linking by computing intersection numbers. So here I've got a curve B with a red surface V2. I've got a curve A, and it intersects here in a single point. And this is linking number, intersection number plus one. If B is the boundary of a two chain V2, then the linking number of A and B is the intersection number of A with V2. In this case, this picture is plus one. So I now claim that a ciphered frame knot has zero helicity. Because if you've got a flux tube and a flux ribbon, and the flux ribbon boundary is C gamma union C gamma prime, the flux ribbon lies on a ciphered surface V. And the helicity is phi squared times the self-linking number. But the self-linking number is zero because uh, C gamma doesn't intersect V prime. So that's the part of the cipher surface that's on the exterior of the tube around C gamma. So the linking number is zero between the linking the curve and its push-off because the push-off lives on the cipher surface. So if I've now I claim you can do the same thing for a framed link of end components. And it's the, the calculation is very much the same. So if I've got a ciphered framed link and it's got a ciphered surface V, then V intersects the boundaries of tubes around each of the AIs producing ribbons and push-offs, AI prime, which is on the boundary of each tube. And I delete the interiors of the ribbons to obtain V prime. So V prime is the trimmed ciphered surface which lives in the exterior of all the tubes tubes. So the boundary of V prime is, I'm calling it L prime, is the union of all these push-offs. So these are the push-offs of the center lines that live on the boundaries of the tubes. L does not intersect V prime because the link is on the inside of these tubes and V prime is on the outside. So the linking number of AI with AJ is also equal to the linking number of AI with AJ prime because you can move inside the tube. You can move AJ, you can isotop AJ to AJ prime just inside the tube and that doesn't bother AI. And so all these linking numbers are the same. Um, doesn't matter whether you're inside the tube or on the boundary if you're computing linking numbers with other curves. Now the linking number of AI with AI prime is the self-linking number of AI. And if you let LI prime be focusing on one of the curves, AI that's on the inside of the tube, it's push off AI prime and then just take all the other curves in the link, this union of AJs with I different from J. Then the linking number of AI with this link, this in component link of its own push off together with all the other curves in the, in the link is zero. And this is true. This is how you can, it's the self linking number plus all these other guys. This, and it's equal to the intersection number, which is zero. And the point is that this, this equation is true for each i as i goes from one to n. And it turns out that this condition here, these n conditions, is both necessary, and here's this the proof that it's necessary, it's also sufficient for the existence of a ciphered surface. So if you've got a bunch of push-offs of a link and you want to know is there a ciphered surface spanning them all, the answer is yes, if and only if all these numbers add up to zero. Um, Well, you can also prove the helicity is zero. I think I'll, I'll skip this for the moment. I'm sort of running out of time. And talk a little bit about the necessary and sufficient condition for cypher framing. So I've got a framing. So the framing is you've got a, a link, oriented link, and you've got a bunch of push off curves that live on the boundary of the link. And I claim that the framing is a cypher framing. In other words, it's a cypher surface and all these push offs live on the surface if and only if each of these equations, the self-linking number of 
each of the curves ri plus the linking of ai aj is zero. Uh, and that's true as i goes from one to n. And the way to prove that it's sufficient is to do a, um, an obstruction theory argument. It turns out that the framing is, gives you a map. You think of the link in the three sphere, delete the interiors of the tubes. That gives you the bounded link complement. The boundary is a bunch of tori. You already have the phase map defined on the bound of boundary tori because of the framing. The framing gives you the phase map on each of these tori pieces. And what you want to do is extend this over a map on the entire exterior X. So on boundary X, you've got phi defined by the framing itself. So that's the map boundary X to the phase circle S1. You have the inclusion map boundary X into X. You want to extend phi to phi tilde. And uh, once you've done that, then you can make phi tilde smooth and then you can take the pullback of the base point that gives you the cyclic surface. So it's an extension problem. It's a, a straightforward problem of obstruction theory. So here I've got the homotopy class of maps from boundary X to S1. And here I've got phi, the phase map, which is given by the framing. The inclusion map, it's a contravariant functor. So the inclusion map gives you a map from a homotopy class of maps from X S1 to I upper star to boundary X S1. Now, because S1 is a K pi one, you have an isomorphism between this thing to the first cohomology group with Z coefficients. So you have this isomorphism here, this isomorphism here. You've got the cohomology exact sequence of the pair X boundary X. And by Poincare duality, you can go down by isomorphisms. All these diagrams are commutative. And H1 boundary X becomes H1, the homology of boundary X coefficients in Z. And now you map over to H1 of X, Z. And X is the link complement. This thing is generated by the meridian curves, a collection of N meridian curves. And uh, this is what you want to compute this map. So you, you take a thing here and it goes to an n-tuple here. It turns out the entries of this n-tuple here are exactly these guys. That's for each i as i goes from one to n. So, so you have a guy here, it goes down to here and it goes to zero over here. So by exactness, it, you can pull it back to this guy and you push it up by isomorphism to give you what you want here. So this gives you something that maps to here. So that's the um, extension. Uh, you can also argue that anti-parallel reconnection preserves everything, the cyber framing, the helicity, the writhe, and the twist. So here I've got anti-parallel reconnection of A union B, and here I've got part of the cyber surface bounding A, anti-parallel reconnection to B, and when you do the reconnection here, the cyber surface reconnects. So the cyber framing goes across, everything goes across. So the twist helicity and cyber framing are all preserved. Now it preserves the cyber framing because helicity is zero both before and after reconnection because cyber framing gives you zero helicity. You know that anti-parallel reconnection conserves the ride and if it also conserves the helicity, then it also conserves the twist. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, here a paper that's been published, one that we're working on and here's some other references. This is an old paper where I did some of this. My student, Irma White, who he was working with us, did a lot of this on the topology of spiral waves. And um, Winfrey and Strogas, we owe a lot to them because a lot of this goes back to their work. So I thank you very much and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Oh. Yes. David, may I ask you uh, to send me uh, the slides of your talk to upload yeah. it uh, on the website of the conference? Oh, so I'll you. just send you uh, the whole PowerPoint thing, just as as such. I'll just ma email it to you, and then you can put it up. That would. It would be wonderful there, thank you. So oh, please questions, comments, remarks.
Tim Snow. So thank you very, very much again for beautiful talk. And we plan to continue next week. So we have speakers for next two times. And we encourage people if they want, if you want to give a talk, just let us know. I think we continue uh, our seminars in July too. At least up to middle of July, but maybe up to end of July. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your invitation. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, DeWitt. Thank, thank you, you DeWitt. That was a great talk. Great talk. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> well done. I'll now go look in my to the trees that are falling. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I took, out, took out my garbage can, so I <laughs> gotta go rescue them. <laughs> yeah. Be careful, however. Have a look up on Titan. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> bye bye. Ciao. Bye bye. Hey, thank bye. you to everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.